We welcome you this day as we celebrate the life of Chad Wesley Roundy. Born on September 16, 1977 in Logan, Utah. Died on July 5th, 2023. I'd like to thank Jenny Richards for the, the music and all of you for being here. I'm Bishop Sharp and I'll be conducting today and we'd like to recognize our president on the stand with us today too, President Ballard. To begin, we will, uh, well, first of all, we, we've already had the family prayer and that was offered by uh, his father-in-law, Jay Pitcher, with the family. We will go ahead and have an opening musical number to begin by Brother Grant Parker, after which we'll have Avery Parker give us our benediction, or a benediction. Thank you. 
Dear Heavenly Father, we are thankful to be gathered here today and celebrate the life of Shadon. Such a wonderful life he lived, and Father, we're very grateful for the plan of salvation and our knowledge of it. And please help us to fill the Savior's love throughout the duration of this meeting. And we're thankful for all the support that we've received. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Thank you, Brother Grant and Sister Avery, for that beautiful musical number. The program will go as follows. We'll first get to hear the life sketch from Sister Holly Falsliff. They will then get to hear from Brother Roland Griffin. We'll have a musical number by Sister Allie Parker, My Own Sacred Grove. And following that musical number, we'll hear from Joby Parker. We'll go to that point. Dad Wesley Roundy was born on a stormy September night while his dad Wes was farming in Bear Lake. With no way to get a hold of him, because remember back in those days there was no cell phones, Mike Mon rode over to find my dad and tell him he had a new son. My dad didn't believe him. First of all, my mom wasn't due for another two weeks. And second of all, the doctor kept telling her the whole time she was having a girl. Shad loved being with his dad on the farm. At age two, he started going out on the tractors with my dad. And my dad said he slept on the tractor floors a lot, being lulled to sleep by the tractors. I've heard that Oliver has taken a pillow and rode through the night with his dad as well on those tractors, except it sounds like you talked the whole night through. <laughs> Shad was the favorite in our family. Let me just give you one example of how I know this is true. Christmas morning, us girls would go out, and there's a couple outfits and a doll on a chair. And then you go downstairs, and there is this huge train set, set up on plywood. I'll give it as on plywood, but of all places, it was on the snooker table. I don't know if anyone, anyone that knows my dad in his snooker table, you do not touch that snooker table. We weren't allowed to sit by the snooker table. And here is this giant train track set on top of the beloved snooker table. Um, Chad would always get us girls playing with him. On the train tracks, the race car sets, anything he got or did, he just had a way of drawing us in and bonding us to him. He really was everyone's favorite. We grew up moving pipe, pulling rye and Dyer's Woad. If you don't know what that is, just consider yourself lucky. Chad put up a lot having three sisters. One time he got sick of his little sister stealing his clothes. He knew this because he counted his hangers, he counted his shirts, he knew exactly what he had. 
One time Stacy came home to no clothes in her closet, like nothing. Shad had taken them and wouldn't give them back until he got his jeans back. I mean, we were talking about a pair of pants, guys, and he took her whole closet. Um, it didn't matter that it was Tommy Brooke that actually stole the jeans. He just didn't care. He just wanted to get his jeans back, and I think it was his way of getting an ally to get those jeans back quicker. Um, he would let Tommy Brooke skip school. He made a bed in his closet for her to hide in because my parents came home sometimes at lunchtime so that she could hurry and hide and wouldn't get caught. Um, when he was literally kind of had a temper, I'm sure the only thing we did was maybe touch his toys. I can't even imagine what we invoked to do his wrath. But one time he chased us down the hall with his cowboy boot that we narrowly escaped by shutting our door, only to open the door to find a hole in our door where the cowboy boot had been smashed into our door. Um, one day he was mad at me. He grabbed a rock and he picked it up and he said, if you take one more step, I'm going to throw this rock. Well, of course I took a step. And dang it, that rock didn't hit me right between my eyes and my forehead. Um, I do know he felt bad about that because he did take off on that three-wheeler of his and we didn't see him for a few hours. So, um, My dad says he owes his life to him. In January 1997, my dad had gone up to treat the grain vents at the farm. He slipped and fell between two bins, two bins and was unconscious. Around four o'clock, my mom realized he was missing and everyone started looking for him. Shad came home from laying carpet and my mom told him, your dad is missing. He's somewhere up on that farm. So around 6.30, Shad dashed up to the farm, got there and walked directly to him. He later told us that he was guided by a voice to my dad. Dad was eventually taken to McKay Hospital and was in ICU for days. Dad spent a long time recovering from the punctured lung and head wound. Shad stayed down at the hospital with him and never left his side and has been by his side ever since. Eventually partnering up and calling their farm West Shadow Farms. Shad loved his friends and they would do anything for him or he talked him into doing anything. I'm not for sure which way it was. But my mom told me at the time she told Shad he couldn't do anything until the yard work got done. The next thing she knows, all his friends are there, sharing Shaz, directing them, telling them what to do, and they got it done, done in no time. And um, I was able to reach out and get some stories from Shaz's friend, and mother, let me tell you, that boy of yours was no angel. Um, some of them they wouldn't share with me because it said they, they said they would incriminate him them. So I've got a few kind of more fun little ones that they gave me that they were thought okay with. Um, one time, Ben and Shad were going up to Nebraska to get a piece of farm equipment. Um, they decided we'll make a hunting trip out of this. So, invited Brian, Hula, I don't know how, you, I'm talking about the same person. If I interchange Brian and Hula, it's the same person. But they invited Brian to go to, for a hunting trip. And then, Shad decides, let's turn it into a bachelor party for Travis. He's getting married in a few days. So. They get Travis, they all head up there and they um, make it, they pick up the farm equipment and then they headed down to go hunting. Um, they started hunting and they were, they decided to put a little wager on this. Whoever got the least amount of birds had to get their hair dyed pink that night in the hotel room. So um, Travis lost. Remember Travis is the one getting married in a couple of days. Travis lost. Um, they had a really bad ice storm, so they ended up, the only room they got in the hotel was the honeymoon suite for these four guys. So they're in the honeymoon suite. Travis had locked himself in the bathroom. Shad and Brian are just sitting out on the bed. We got all night. We got all night. So Travis eventually came out, said, let's get this over with. So they um, had all this stuff, dyed his hair pink. I mean, they made a mess. They stained the tubs, the seams, everything. I could just only imagine. But they made a mess and Travis woke up with bright pink hair. Um, it was a bad ice storm, like I said. And so on the way home, when they finally got home, it took them quite a while. I think Travis's wedding was the next day. Um, his mom caught sight of the pink hair and was not happy, she tried to fix it, went and got some dye, did a pretty good job, but it sounds like he had purple hair for his wedding pictures. Um, Brian tells a story of they were going to the fair, and he knew Ben, ben was with him, and they were going to the fair, and they go out to Valley View. 
that stop sign and just Shad was driving, did a quick break, you know, quick stop, just basically ran the stop sign anyway, but went through it and the one car that passed him was a cop. So flipped around and Shad looks at Ben, he's like, I don't have my license suspended and Ben's like I don't have my license either and then poor Brian is like I've got mine what do you want me to do so Shad jumps over Ben and Ben jumps over and Brian ends up in the driver's seat and the police co the cop walks up and he's like you're the one driving and he's like yeah of course I'm the one driving so he gets a ticket and Brian looks at Shad he's like so are you gonna pay this ticket he's like no <laughs> You were the one driving. Isn't that what you told him? I'm pretty sure you said you were the one driving. Um, they had poker games. Lots of them would get together, and I guess it must have been legendary because some kids showed up with some money in their pocket. Um, they were a couple of years younger than these guys and um, wanted to be in on this poker game. Well, they started losing. Well, Shad and his friends, they started losing. So Shad's like, I'll be the dealer. So he gets to be the dealer, and he... And Ben sat by him, he said he was out of money, he must have not been home or something, So, because Ben was out of money, he said. So Ben was sent by Shad, and Shad would deal just enough so Ben could see the cards and stuff, and then, um, so when Ben knew that Skinny had a good hand, he'd like kick him under the table so that he knew that he had the best hand, well they ended up taking all the money from those guys. So they won like $50, had lots of Mountain Dew, it was a good time. Um, lots of hunting stories, lots of stories involving the three-wheeler. Um, one time, um, Brandon and him were duck hunting. My dad was driving the brown truck, and those two were just standing up on the cab while my dad was driving down the lane. He's going at pretty good speed, and I guess my dad swerved a little bit, and Shad flew out of the truck. And Brandon's knocking on the cab, telling my dad that Shad, you know, Shad's back there. So they um, turned around basically just cleaned out the gun and just were off again to hunt. Um, one day Shad and Ben had gone to a horse race in Wyoming Downs. Shad had spotted this gorgeous blonde and asked Ben if he knew who the hot blonde was. Ben told him she was Jay and Terry Pitcher's daughter. After that, Shad called multiple times to ask her out. She didn't know him at all. She was very hesitant, but finally said yes. She was expecting this dorky cowboy to show up at her door. She had a plan to be a total brat on this date. That'll show him. As soon as she opened the door, she took one look at Shad and changed her mind, deciding this is going to be a fun night. They had a blast at the fair and got along so well. That night she came home to tell her mom she made it home and of laying on her bed and said, I'm gonna marry that guy. He was the perfect match for that blonde spitfire. But I have to say that blonde Spitfire had to be a very special to put up with my chef. <laughs> she needed someone just like you, Brittany. They were married in the Salt Lake Temple on January 10th, 2002, and they started their life in a little pink house in Cash Junction. They had an incredible ability to build things together, a house, a home, a farm, a barn, several sheds, and a grazing mountainside for their cattle. After years of effort and pain, their greatest achievement finally came with the birth of their precious son, Oliver. Shad's world revolved around his son, and he devoted himself to teaching Oliver everything he knew about farming, fixing things, collecting toy farms, loving animals, and taking care of Brittany. Anytime Shad spoke of Oliver, his face would light up, his voice would soften. He loved Oliver so much and was so proud of him. Shad had many nieces and nephews, he had nieces that chipped away and broke down that tough shell of I don't do kid, kids kind of thinking. He became their biggest protectors. One of the nieces had slept over at Shad and Britt's house. Late one night, Brittany went to check on her and couldn't find her anywhere. She panicked, started looking everywhere until she heard Shad call from downstairs in his recliner. She's right here. There she was, nestled sound asleep on Shad. Many remember fighting over the gifts he brought at Christmas, loved all the hints he gave them for the golden egg at Easter, and loved times he took them boating in the summer and then sledding in the winter. He was always up for buying cat cars, the popcorn, the tumblers, any fundraiser that was going on. You knew Shad was gonna take something from you. He was kind and giving and left you laughing. Heck, he even had a baby doll named after him. Many helped him on the farm cleaning out pivots, being told they would get 
a little wet, so you're coming away being completely drenched while shad stay dried as can be. One got the job of crawling in an algae-filled water tank that had to be 120 degrees inside. Just to be told, what are you complaining about? You are getting a paid spa day in your own sauna. <laughs> Shad was the truest of friends, and even to people he did not know well. If it was broke, he could fix it for you. If you needed an extra hand, he was there to give it. Shad loved his father in heaven and his savior and practiced the purest religion, loving God with all he had and his neighbors as himself. We love you, Shad. We are better for knowing you and getting to be a part of your life. Thank you for the light and love you shared. Our hurts, hearts will never be the same. But how lucky we were to have someone that we've seen goodbye so hard. I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. I didn't think this was going to be this difficult. When Jay came in and I saw the pain and sorrow on his face, it's a sign of true love. And I can see it in all of your faces, especially Brittany and Oliver's. When Brittany and her mom came to my place a, a week ago, and Brittany said she had the impression that I should speak, I thought, that surprised me because there's a lot of people that are a lot closer to Brittany and Shad than, than I am. I've, I've known both of them for a long time and had the opportunity to coach Shad in soccer and baseball and, and seen play other sports. Oliver, your grandpa Jay would say, uh, you have good bloodlines. Your dad is a good athlete. Your mom's a good athlete. You're going to be a winner. But as Brittany said, she had the impression, I thought, I need to take this very seriously. I need to know what the Lord would have me say. And so I pondered and prayed about that, and some impressions came to me. And I serve in the temple on Tuesday mornings, and so I took the opportunity to take those impressions to the Lord, to have him verify that that was correct, and he did. The first impression I had was of Joseph F. Smith. Hiram Smith was killed in 1844 alongside his brother, the prophet Joseph Smith. Hiram was about the same age as Shad. Mary Fielding was about the same age as Brittany. Joseph F. was a couple of years younger than Oliver. And they were heartbroken, devastated, just as all of you are. But life goes on. Four years later, they join a company of saints going to the Salt Lake Valley. The captain of that company tells Mary Fielding, you're gonna be a nuisance. You and your family are gonna be a nuisance to this company. She tells him, I will do my part and I will beat you into the valley. Joseph F. is about Oliver's age now and he's put in charge of keeping track of the family livestock which is not an easy task when you're crossing the plains. And they lose some one time. But because of the great faith that Mary Fielding had, they found them. Same faith that Brittany has. Later on down the, in the journey, an ox went down, appeared to be dying. Mary Fielding again with her faith and prayers commanded that ox to rise and it did to the amazement of all those who witnessed it very strong woman just like Brittany is they got into Salt Lake Valley and yes they did arrive in, before the captain and young Joseph S. was driving an ox team Fast forward 50 plus years, Joseph F. Smith is now the prophet of the church, same as President Nielsen is today. 
He receives a revelation, section 138 of the Doctrine and Covenants. And what does it talk about? It talks about where Shad is today. If you were able to see with your spiritual eyes, you would see a handsome young man, absolutely perfect in stature, not a hair on his head lost. And he will remain that way forever. Well, what is he doing? President Smith, through the Savior, said he will be teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ to thousands upon thousands of people who have lived on this earth that have not heard the gospel or who have heard it and maybe rejected it or didn't understand it. And he will be converting them. Shed will be converting thousands upon thousands. And what can we do to help Shed? We can go to the temple and do that work for those dead that they might have eternal life with our heavenly parents. So every time you get a chance to go to the temple, go and help Shad along. The other impression I had, one of the other impressions I had was the Book of Mormon. I know Brittany loves the scriptures and I'm assuming Oliver does as well. And I'll make you a promise that if you'll read in the Book of Mormon every day of your life, that you will find peace and joy and the answers to all the problems that come to you in life. The other impression I got was for forgiveness. My grandfather used to tell me, the only thing you can take with you or that you can get back is what you give away. If you give away love, you get love back. If you give away kindness, you get kindness back. And likewise, if you give bitterness, you get bitterness back. And if you give forgiveness, you get forgiveness back. The Savior said, if you can't forgive, you can't be forgiven. Brittany may be upset with me what I'm going to ask, but I'll take my chances. I don't know their financial state, but I know most farmers have debt. And what I'm going to ask is that whoever that debt is to, that they forgive them 100%. Now you might think that's easy for me to just say, but I've experienced that several times in my life. I'll give you an example. A couple of ladies came to our house with a business adventure, and it was something that Michelle was interested in and very good at. And we thought, well, we can handle that investment. So we talked about it and decided, yeah, that's a good thing. But when we prayed about it that night, we both had a negative feeling. But like dummies, we went ahead with it. Sometimes uh, you learn the hard way, but the spirit never lies. A couple of years down the road, the business failed. We had signed a note saying we were liable for the debt that was already there when we went in, plus everything else that was occurred. The morning that I was to go to the bank and find out what the final verdict would be. I opened the scriptures and I thought, I'm just going to let them fall open and I'll read wherever they fall open. They fell open to the book of Job. And I thought, this is not good. <laughs> but I know how the story of Job ends. So I went with an open heart and an open mind. The other partners could not pay any of the debt. And we'd signed on a note and it became liable for us. We took everything out of savings, cashed out an insurance policy we had, liquidated everything we could, and we paid off the debt, and it was substantial. The other two instances I've never shared before, but I think this might be an appropriate time. General contractor called me up and said, drywaller on a three-story motel in Brigham can't finish the job, can you come and finish it? I said, sure, we can come and do that. But I didn't get anything signed. I took his word that he would pay us. We got all done with the job. I met with the contractor, the other drywaller, and the contractor says, 
that drywaller owes us this much money. You're going to have to get your money from him. I knew he didn't have any money. I told him, I said, well, if you get rich someday, you can pay us. Otherwise, I forgive you. Again, as a general contractor, we acted and we remodeled a home for a family that I knew couldn't pay it. But this time I thought, well, I'm going to have them sign a contract because they wanted to. And we gave them five years, and at the end of five years, they couldn't pay, and we just frankly forgave them. And every time, we were blessed spiritually and temporally. And I promise you that whatever debt there is, if it's forgiven, you will be blessed spiritually and temporally. I notice that the closing song is, God be with you till we meet again. Shad's message to Brittany and Oliver and to all of us would be, put his unfailing arms around you. God be with you till we meet again. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.
Well, here we are. First and foremost, before I share any of my thoughts, I just want to tell uh, Brittany, Jay, and Terry, and Wesson, and Jean, how sorry I am. And what an incredible honor it is to be able to talk about my friend Chad. Give me a sec, we'll get through it. It's been amazing to me how my life has intertwined with these two families. Um, Stacy was my boss at Herf Jones and she could crack a whip and uh, but I loved it I loved working with her I loved to work hard and she didn't let anybody mess around and then a year or two later Tommy Brooke and I also worked at Herf Jones and I think we solved all the world's problems uh, at night working on the computers even though we weren't supposed to be talking and then I had an amazing opportunity of coaching both of Holly's boys in football and both of them have given me some of my favorite memories of that game now the pitchers on the other hand we Chad and I had quite an experience growing growing up as men in these families <laughs> um, I wanted to share with you a little bit of that Chad and I, we had some inside jokes that they probably didn't even know about. Um, so if you're my age or around that or a little older, and uh, maybe some of you that are young, your parents might have shared with you a little bit, but you may recognize this guy right here. This is Gizmo, and he's a gremlin, okay? And there are three rules if you own a gremlin. One is they cannot have sunlight. Two, you can't ever get them wet. And three, you can't ever feed them after midnight. If you do, if you break any of those three rules, the gremlin turns into this right here. I don't know if you can see it in the back, it's a long ways away, but if you know what the gremlin movie is. is. Well, the pitchers have three rules that Shad and I came up with. to take them from gizmos to the gremlin. <laughs> Number one is get them to bed before midnight. <laughs> they don't deal well with lack of sleep. So we made sure that they always could get to bed. Make sure that they have something to do. They don't do well with sitting with nothing to do. They love to work. They love to be busy. Oliver has that. Oliver finds peace in work. He's the most happy when he's working with you on a project. And the last one, and heaven forbid, is make sure they are fed. We were at uh, Disney World. This was the first trip we took together. And we had been walking and we didn't know that this Epcot, the Epcot Center with all the different countries and stuff was so long that we started country after country. We thought the first few were pretty cool and we thought things and then and Chad and I were just fine. But things in front of us with the family started to crumble. And I'll never forget walking out of Epcot and we, Chad and I were about 20 feet behind and they were all at each other. <laughs> and. Uh, I just looked over at Shad, and he looked at me and he just said, Who are we with? <laughs> and I said, I don't know, buddy, but we better hang together. Shad loved pranks. Shad loved to laugh. Uh, Brooke and I and Shad and Brittany went to Las Vegas together for a weekend. And 
we had a reservation to go to P.F. Chang's. And you know how in Las Vegas, if you've ever been there, you're like, well, just walk, right? It all looks like it's close. <laughs> and we had a reservation. We were walking and we were looking and we were realizing, holy cow, we're going to be late. So then we started walking fast and real fast. And we were just hoofing it because we didn't want to miss our reservation because as I've told you, you've got to keep these women fed. <laughs> So we're flying through all the people and everything like that. We're just going 100 miles an hour. Well, unbeknownst to Brooke and I, we were in front, Chad and Brittany were behind. If you've been to Las Vegas at night, you know the guys that click the cards, right? They hand out these cards, and on these cards are extremely inappropriate images. And we're walking the entire time. We sit down at P.F. Chang's, we finally make our reservation and everything like that. We sit down, we go through our entire dinner. The card, the time to pay comes, Brooke opens her purse and it's got about 50 of those cards <laughs> in her purse. <laughs> he had been grabbing every single one as we were walking and drop them in her purse. <laughs> Fast forward quite a few years, we've had the boys, and then we have our twin girls, and how old were they when this happened? Like, a few months old, one years old, okay? I mentioned to you the importance of sleep, right? Well, you don't mess with Brooke's sleep, and you don't mess with her kids' sleep. We're laying in our little house in Smithfield, and we have our, uh, our window outside of our bedroom, and right underneath that is the girls' window in the basement. And it's like 3, 30, 4 o'clock in the morning. And we're about sound asleep. And I hear, ur, ur, ur. and it was one of those things where I'm like, I think I just dreamed there was a Brewster crowing, and that was weird. I'm just gonna go back to sleep. I don't know, 10, 15 minutes later, another crow, ur, ur. this time I bump Brooke. Brooke, there's a rooster outside of our window. And she's like, I don't care. Go to sleep. <laughs> so it happens again. And I'm like, no, Brooke, I'm serious. There's a rooster outside of her. And I'm like, I got to go take care. I got to get it out of here. We're never going to be able to sleep. So I get up, throw some shorts on or whatever. I walk outside and I go around with a flashlight. And there's a cage this big with the biggest rooster I've ever seen in my entire life in the cage. I go back into Brooke, I'm like, there is a massive rooster inside of a cage outside, and I don't know what to do. And we sat there, we're like, well, what do we do? I'm like, do you think, like, somebody that knew the previous owners of the house, like, dropped off a rooster? We couldn't figure it out. So we called animal control. We're like, I don't know what to do with this rooster. <laughs> and so, anyway, we get through it, everything like that, and then later in the morning, Brittany calls and just goes, how's your rooster doing? <laughs> These turds have dropped off a rooster right underneath our window in the middle of the night. Uh, he did a lot of stuff like that. One of the other funny ones was he, he hooked up a speaker inside Brooke's car under the hood that every time she pushed the brakes, it did the Dukes of Hazard theme and everything. Uh, he was amazing. Um, uh, Shad couldn't sell or throw anything away. It was only a few weeks ago that I, I can't remember what we were talking about. And I was like, Chad, those things are really become value. You ought to sell them. And he looked at me. No, Joe, we don't sell anything. <laughs> In fact, he actually reversed it. One day we're hanging out at our house and he shows up with this little mini motorcycle that's run off electricity that he had found in a dumpster and it worked perfectly. And he goes, here, your girls use it. And then when they outgrow it, Oliver can ride it. And my girls named it Hollywood. And they rode it all over the place. Um, he was an incredible friend. And as Holly already mentioned, he made everything funner. Everything funner. That trait is still alive. As I coached football, I was telling Kyle about it the other day. We had a drill that... It was called Bobcat Makers, and it was absolutely freaking terrible. And I'll never forget Mason standing there as we were going through. Guys are literally puking. Mason's laughing, and he's got everybody on the line laughing at it. That trait is alive. You make everything funner. Um, 
Chad teased me all the time because he didn't believe that I had a real job. I have an advertising agency. And he was like, I don't know what Job does for work. And I, for a while I was traveling there and he was absolutely convinced I had a second family. <laughs> he would ask me how they were doing all the time. <laughs> um, I think as you can tell that, uh, as you guys know, um, Chad was just, he was uh, an incredible, incredible person to be around. And I don't know why. I don't know why things like this happen to Chad. I really don't. And to people like Chad. Um, that's been the fun stuff. Now I'm going to touch into a little bit of the hard and the beautiful stuff. One of the first times I ever spent any time with Chad, uh, Hula Reese and Ben will remember this. I don't, I don't even know why we were there or anything, but we were at Chad's house, at his parents' house, and there's a little Chad out back. I don't even remember most of it. I don't even know why I remember this, but I always have. I remember the dogs and everything. I went into the shed with Shad, and up on the wall, there was like a cutout of a blonde girl in a swimsuit. You remember her band, Reese? And things like that? It was just a blonde girl. Now it wasn't. It wasn't naughty or anything like that. But it was a very pretty girl in a blonde swimsuit. And I remember when I walked in there, and I was like, "Oh my gosh!" I was like, "Brittany is Shad's dream girl." She was. Like, it looked just like Brittany. And uh, I've never forgotten that picture. Um, Shad was built to handle Brittany. <laughs> there are not many women who can rage so strong and yet love so tenderly. He knew how to handle both. He knew when it was time to argue back and make his point, and more importantly, he knew when it was time to be quiet and let the storm pass. Shad treated my children like they were his children. When they were having such a hard time having a baby and Grant was getting into that age that's just super fun, I don't know, five or six years old. You know, you buy your nephews and stuff like regular gifts, right? For Christmas. Well, he walks in and he has one of those sit down sleds for Grant for Christmas. And it was incredible. And we still have it in our garage right now. And every one of our kids have sled on that thing like crazy, even when they were like 15 years old. Um, he was so tight with my girls. And just like they said, when Avery was little and she'd get in trouble with us, She'd yell, instead of for my mom, she would say, I want my Brit Brit. And even to today, when any of my girls have problems and they need some time, they go to grandma's and they go to Brittany's. Because they just know it's all the same. Um, Chad couldn't say no to my girls. If anything, no matter what they wanted, they would ask Shad. And not only that, Brittany knew it. So there's times where Brittany wanted some stuff. <laughs> so they got this shiny boat and everything. It just sits in the shed and the girls would be like, let's go boating. Brittany goes, hey, I'd love to, but he won't go if I ask. Why don't you go ask him? <laughs> so Brittany at times used my girls to get what she wanted. Um, he was incredible at making you feel valuable. He always wanted your thoughts or opinions on the decisions he faced. Um, Avery even told me that he asked her opinion one time on a gasket that he was looking at to buy, like Avery knew anything about gaskets. <laughs> and he was serious and he wanted to know her thoughts because he was so talented at making you feel valuable and loved. He made you feel needed. Um, to Shad, Oliver came first. I do believe the Shad deep inside knew this would happen. But they agreed to all this before. And they were willing to take on an unbelievable challenge. He taught him everything he knew about farming that he could to his son in the time that he had with him. It's been amazing to me and to all of us 
as these questions over the past few days have had come up about the farm and about intricate things, about the pivot, about how to get into a field, about how to this and everything like that. There's grown men calling a nine-year-old boy right now to ask real questions and he's giving real answers. I even took a picture on that first day as they came and those, young, those men were talking and Oliver was standing with them and they were just all talking. And not one of those men looked at Oliver like, what are you doing here? Oliver's a man already. Um, like I mentioned, I, I don't know why this happened, guys. I wish I could tell you. I have seen three others in my life within the last five years face this trial. I don't understand any of them. I lost my brother to cancer and watched his wife and kids trial through it and two of my friends lost their wives all within the last five years. Uh, one of my friends lost his wife to cancer and another one lost his wife in the middle of the night. She fell asleep and didn't wake up. I reached out to each one of them and just asked them, what, would you, what could you say to Brittany? My sister-in-law said, this is your journey. And although everyone wants to help, you need to trust your gut. And most importantly, be kind to yourself. Time will help and you'll treasure every memory and speak of him often. My one friend said, you're in hell right now. Forgive me. And it's hard to see how anything could get, get better. But it will get better. There is a light at the end of, the tunnel, of this tunnel and you will begin to see it. Things will get better and you won't feel like this forever. There are many happy days ahead filled with wonderful memories of Shad. And my other friend said, just keep remembering him. And think of the incredible reunion we'll have, all thanks to a loving Savior that made it all possible. There's two scriptures that when my brother passed that I wanted to share with you. Brother Griffin hinted to both of them. The first one was, I didn't feel my brother right after he died. I couldn't feel him and it bothered me a lot. I just didn't understand why can't I feel him, why can't I feel him. So I wondered where he was. Now concerning the state of the soul between the death and the resurrection, behold, it has been made known unto me by an angel that the spirits of all men, as soon as they are departed from this mortal body, yea, the spirits of all men, whether they be good or evil, are taken home to that God who gave them life. And I wondered, well, okay, well, that's great. He's with, he's with Heavenly Father. Why can't I feel him? In the Doctrine and Covenants 138, it says, But behold, from among the righteous, he organized his forces and appointed messengers clothed with power and authority and commissioned them to go forth and carry the light of the gospel to them that were in darkness, even to all the spirits of men. And thus was the gospel preached to the dead. And I prayed and prayed to understand. And when I finally felt the presence of my brother in the temple, He said, I've been busy. I've been very, very busy. I'd like to just let you know that you will feel him as well. I still feel my brother. I talk to him in the car, in the temple, ask him for help with hard things. He's there. And he's been there for my kids. I've had examples of that. I want to leave you with this. If you want to know where to find Shad, where is Shad? I can tell you where he will be. Shad will be in the first light that hits your mountain, showing you all that needs to be done 
and reminding you to make the most of each day. He will be in the hot noon sun telling you no matter what, you can't quit, that the work's got to get done. You will also find Shad in the grease and sweat, in the long hours of the day, in the cab of the tractor, in the fields, and in the shed. You will find him right at the moment where this all feels too hard to handle and too much to bear. He will be there giving you strength to take one more step forward and another and another. Then each and every evening as the sun sets right over the farm, he will show you a beautiful sunset to tell you how proud he is of the day you've put in. Sunsets are never the same now. They are even more beautiful and special because they are shad sets now. Then in the darkness of night, you will find him in the sounds of the crickets and the breeze as it rolls over the fields and into your lungs, reminding you tomorrow he'll be there again. When his light hits your mountain, I say that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Joby. So we will close this procession by singing hymn number 132. If I can read, sorry, 152. God be with you till we meet again. After which, Sister Brittany Roundy will come and give us our closing prayer.
our Father in heaven, we are grateful for the spirit that thou hast blessed us with today. We're grateful for the inspiration that thou hast sent to comfort all of us. Father in heaven, we're grateful for the angels here and on the other side of the bell who are holding so many hearts, so many broken hearts together. We're grateful for the knowledge of the gospel. Father in heaven, we love our Savior and his sacrifice that we will rise again and we will be together again. Father in heaven, we ask that thou might bless Oliver, that he might always remember his dad, that he will fill his dad every day. Shad, I love you. Father in heaven, we ask that our testimonies stay strong and close so that we can be together again. Watch over us at this time as we take Shad to the cemetery and thank all of those who are helping us. We say these things humbly in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, amen. amen. Brothers and sisters, I would just like to point out the spirit. That tender feeling of peace that we're feeling right now. And thank the Lord for that. As we go towards the, the funeral, or the, sorry, I can't even think now. We will go to the cemetery, um, we would ask that the following casket bearers, please, as we go out, we'll, we'll have them please meet at the south foyer here to help there. Um, those casket bearers are, go as follows. We will have Wesley Roundy, Jay Pitcher, Oliver Shad Roundy, Joe B. Parker, Kyle Falslov, Brandon Pitcher, Christopher Corey Kozak, Brett Fonsbeck, Ben Griffin, and Reese Jenkins. And the honorary Paul Bearers are as follows. Grant Parker, Bracken Falslove, Mason Falslove, Taylor Palis, Aaron Fonsbeck, Sam Fonsbeck, and Brian Hall. We'll go ahead and, if the audience would please rise. <laughs> 